everyone and welcome to the Scottish Games Network podcast. I'm Andrew and this week we've got another interview from Seb. As we've mentioned on the podcast before, Seb is the host of the Scottish Business podcast and as part of the podcast's run, he interviewed four people from the games industry in Scotland. And this is the second of those interviews with Mark Williamson from Tag Games in Dundee. Tag are a mobile games developer And despite being one of the most prolific developers in the country, chances are most uh, game players haven't heard of them. And the reason for that is that Tag is a business-facing developer, meaning that they're primarily um, completing projects for clients and doing work behind the scenes. And in doing so, they've worked with some really big names in entertainment. For example, they've worked with Adult Swim on Pocket Mortys, which is based on the Rick and Morty franchise. They've worked with Rovio, the creators of Angry Birds, and the BBC, and Mind Candy, the creators of Mushy Monsters. And, the, you know, these are games which have seen millions of downloads and players over, over the years. So in his conversation with Seb, Mark goes into what it's like being a business-facing developer and how there's so much going on behind the scenes in the Scottish games industry that you don't necessarily hear about because of that kind of relationship. They also talk about the advantages of being in Dundee compared with other places in Scotland and in the UK in general, and the advantages of being a business that grows slowly rather than an overnight sensation. So please enjoy this conversation between Seb Mackay and Mark Williamson of Tag Games. How are you? Thank you for coming and, and hanging out. Yeah, no worries. I, I'm good, thanks. Um, it's, you know, we're a few weeks into the new year. Um, had a good Christmas break. Um, so I think all of the, the cobwebs and stuff have been blown blown out of everyone's brain right now. So we're, mm. we're back at full speed. It's good. Very nice. What were you playing over the Christmas break? Um, well, actually, I had... Uh, my firstborn son arrived a month early over Christmas. Wow. Um, so I didn't really have, thank you. I really didn't have a lot of time to play any uh, products uh, at all. Um, I did have a Stadia uh, controller turn up and I did turn that on and was, you know, playing playing some Stadia uh, games, like games on Stadia, mm-hmm. um, because I'd not actually experienced Stadia up to that point. So I did, I did get a good few hours um, playing around Stadia over the Christmas break, yeah. Nice. What was that like? Because Stadia is a weird one for me where I thought, why do I want to pay a subscription fee plus pay for the games when I've already got a PS4 and PlayStation Plus? Do you know, like I couldn't balance yeah. the the difference there? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, um, like it, uh, the reason I, I, reason I got it was for Cyberpunk. Like mm-hmm. my, my actual home PC would need a considerable amount of upgrading to play a decent version of Cyberpunk. Um, so I got it for that. And I have been kind of blown away about how good Stadia is. Like the, the experience has been really good. Uh, so yeah, um, I've got, I've played for, I paid for the pro thing, which is, you know, eight quid a month or something. Um, and I was just kind of, you know, my return on investment was like, okay, if I want to play some of these games that um, are really high quality, uh, I'm going to have to fork out, you know, three, four hundred pounds to for a new graphics card on my on my machine. Uh, um, whereas, you know, I can I can put eight quid a month in to the Stadia and uh, and I can play it straight away, and I can play it wherever I like, which. I, this isn't an advert for Stadia, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, I was just, I was just very impressed with it. Actually, I was, um, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was definitely a naysayer when I first heard about it um, years ago, and hadn't really jumped in and experienced it, and was impressed. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. I can fully understand and appreciate how that will be eventually the future of gaming. Um, and I think that's very exciting. You know, I think there's a lot of cool things that can come out of it, but I do feel I, maybe at, at this point, I just, it just doesn't have the value proposition for me, but also I feel like my home internet's not that great. I live mm. in a tenement building, you know, and like 
sometimes Zoom calls glitch out. So I'm like, how the hell am I going to stream Cyberpunk? So I think that's, but that's a Lexus Stadia thing and more of a Edinburgh infrastructure thing. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I like when it, when when Cyberpunk came out and the whole office is talking about it and everyone's like, oh, it doesn't work on my PS4. Like, mm, it's just a bad experience. I was playing it on a 150 pound Chromebook at 1080p, 30 frames a second. And I was like, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, wow, okay. Um, and that, that, was the, that was the thing that was kind of mind blowing for me. I had this junk, junk machine that was playing this product that, that no one else could put, really play in the office until they were upgrading their PCs. So. Yeah, I think I haven't played Cyberpunk either. My plan is to give it a year. And then when I finally get my mitts on a PS5 or a um, Series X, it'll be beautiful. And there'll be no bugs in any of the systems or in any of the games. And I'll just sail in incredibly late to the party. But yeah. it's funny because one of the things that I've noticed doing these like conversations with industry people is it's so easy as a fan, as it were, to get caught up in like the new tech and the new games and stuff. And everyone I've spoken to so far has been like, oh yeah, I was playing Cyberpunk on like a base PS4 or, oh man, I haven't even thought about it yet. My stack is like you know, this high and goes back years. And I think it's such an interesting thing to see that, uh, I suppose it is a juxtaposition between that sort of rabid fan base of having to eat everything up as soon as it comes out. And then the industry guys that are sort of less chill about it and just kind of doing their own thing, you know? Yeah, I think we've, there's uh, a tiny bit of, um, you know, looking behind the curtain, uh, you know, once you're in the industry, um, I'm not going to say the shine has taken off, you know, you're still a massive fan of everything, but you see how everything works. You've got, you know, your, your day, your day to day is, um, is building games uh, and solving the problems with building games. Um, and sometimes playing a brand new product that has problems <laughs> and has issues isn't as relaxing as you might think because you've just spent the entire day doing that. Right. So, um, yeah, I think I think a lot of people that I know uh, are way more chill about being playing things through straight away or um, getting the even getting the latest console. You know, it'll be like, OK, here's the launch date. OK, well, I'll get it in six months. You know, it does. You know, I've still got I've still got X amount of stuff to get through. I've got I've got way too much stuff to play right now. So why add this to the list? Basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a nice healthy thing. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about tag because we mm. we won't get away without you know diving into what you do. And I guess the whole point of this is to really dig into the Scottish industry. Um, so tell me, you know, what makes Scotland such a great place for tag to exist as opposed to England or Los Angeles or somewhere like that? Great. Yeah. Well, I mean, so tag uh, twenty twenty one will be tag's fifteenth year in business. So. I've been around it. Yeah, I've been around a fair bit. And um, I think it was formed out of, I suppose, uh, the, the chairman and founder, Paul Farley, was at DMA Design mm -hmm. uh, when they were doing Grand Theft Auto. And I think it, a lot of it comes down to DMA Design, actually. Um, them starting up, uh, you know, because it was there was a Timex factory here in Dundee, uh, and they were building. Um, oh, history is going to fail me now. I can't remember exactly which uh, machine they were building. Was Sinclair? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you know, a, a group of hobbyists were programming and decided to start doing games and and that's that's kind of where <laughs> the Dundee scene came from, I suppose. And what's, what's so great about Tag being here is just the, the depth of talent that is still around. Like, mm -hmm. um, plus the, the universities, we have some world-class universities on our doorstep. So we always have fresh talent coming in and there's the depth of talent that being here for 20, 30 years, <laughs> you know, building products. So, um, for, for the size of size of city um, that Dundee is, you know, it's what 150, 160,000 people or something. There's what, 10, 15 game studios, something like that. Like 
you know, it's uh, an extraordinary amount for the the size uh, of, of city. So um, I think it's um, there's obviously something here that's attracting people uh, mm. <laughs> for that. Uh, and, and you can see it as well in um, the recent announcements that the Dundee Council are obviously looking to get uh, this um, uh, e-sports arena um, built. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of investment in, in kind of games and the digital sector uh, here. So, yeah, it's, I mean, the reason we're here... One, we, we started here, like our founders, our founders uh, lived here. But two, we haven't, there's not really been a need to, to move. Mm. Um, the talent is here. Uh, and we don't, you know, in this day and age, you don't have to be located anywhere to, um, to service uh, your clients. Um, so why move? Yeah, exactly. It's interesting because the rich history of games in, in Dundee especially has come up a lot. And obviously there's DMA, there's Lemmings, there's Grand Theft Auto, there's Ruffian. Like we, we all know those ones. One of the things from a business point of view that I think is really interesting is what has perhaps stopped the games industry being dragged kicking and screaming out of Dundee and dropped into Edinburgh or London. Like it seems odd to me that there's not... I don't know, like an attraction through tax breaks or a specific game, specific games industry funding and stuff. And yet the cluster has built itself and the cluster, you know, not only survives, but as you well know, continues to just thrive amazingly. Yeah, well, I think each, I think you go to any city really, and there will be a small games cluster. Um, you know, Edinburgh, Edinburgh has Rockstar, obviously, there's Build the Rocket Boy, there's, you know, five or six other studios that um, if I put any brain power into, I could recall, um, uh, you know, Rockstar uh, are there because, um, you know, the, the tech talent uh, in Edinburgh, like Edinburgh has an, an amazing um, depth of talent in tech, um, but also, um you know they can afford to be there, right? Mm. So here's here, like Dundee is a relatively inexpensive place to run a studio from, uh, whereas you know you go and put a studio in the middle of London or the middle of Edinburgh, um, it costs a significant amount more uh, to run that studio. Your overheads uh, are a lot higher, um, and you have to have some very successful products to guarantee that you're going to stick around um, when you. You're paying through the nose for uh, business rates, basically. Um, but th those locations are attractive to staff. So, you know, there's, there's the offset of that. It's like, you know, pe people want to live in, in the middle of London for the, or the middle of Edinburgh or, or Glasgow or any, or to take any city for the nightlife and, and the culture and, and stuff that's there. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, you just got to balance that really about how, how much, uh, how how much do you need to access the talent that's in that location? Um, and I think Dundee is just in a really lucky. Like it's it's really, um, it's, it's quite, I suppose it's quite lucky, really, that that the, the universities are focused heavily in, in gaming and animation, um, and the depth here doesn't means that we have a steady influx of staff. Uh, we don't have to locate to another place to attract staff. Um, so, yeah. One of the things too that um, I think is particularly interesting, and as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that I'm slowly losing my train of thought, which is obviously a wonderful thing. Um, but when you look at the, you know, you were saying about having successful products and we have a really deep, technical talent pool right but we don't tend to kind of shout about ourselves too much i was talking to colin from rivet games the other day about making train simulator dlc and about how they've they've just carved out a niche doing that and that's a thing that exists so for you guys how you know what's it been like carving out that niche in, in such a Hypersaturated sounds so sort of snobby, but I guess it effectively is, right? Um, the games market. Yeah, so so tag has been around for a while, as mentioned, fifteen years, and we were focused on mobile and 
uh, well, I can say mobile tablet, tablet didn't exist then. Um, mobile was barely uh, color screens uh, mm. at that time. So um, we had, we forged our own little niche right away. When mobile gaming was um, considered such a niche that, you know, it was just, people just turned their noses up at it. Um, like what, what's going to happen here? And thankfully Apple kind of changed uh changed the world again with the with the iPhone and made people look at actually what these devices could do. Um, and we have kind of always been a very technical studio, um, great depth of knowledge about the platforms themselves. So when people wanted to move into mobile, uh, like traditional publishers or other developers, you know, we found ourselves in a position that we were able to help them. Uh, and we are not a studio that could shout about ourselves a lot because we're often behind the scenes mm -hmm. building products for a larger organization. Like for instance, you know, we've um, working with that, we've been working with Adult Swim on something for Rick and Morty. Uh, there's, you know, been working with Natural Motion Singer and helping on uh, CSR2. Um, we've done things with Rovio, we've done things with Activision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we're not the lead, like we're not the headline partner in that conversation. You know, it's Zynga mm. and Adult Swim or the IP is, you know, Angry Birds. Um, so we often are behind the scenes doing a, doing a good job, delivering for our clients, uh, having great relationships. Um, but when not the, we, we are not able to go out and wave the banner basically because Essentially, it's not our product at the end of it. We finish it and we hand it over and it's their product. So um, it's, it's a difficult position to be in sometimes because you really do want to shout about the things you've worked on. Um, and sometimes you're not allowed to or not able to. Um, but the, the business to business side of, um, the, of the industry know what we've done. Uh, and that's how we keep going because they they hear that we've worked on this product for someone and it was a good job. So someone else comes and speaks to us about something they need doing, you know. So most games players will never have heard of Tag because we're not customer facing. We're very business business to business uh, organization. And that's an interesting point. So I work my day job as business to business and has been for years. But often when we think, and I do this as a gamer, I'm always thinking about like consumer facing games and consumer facing games companies and stuff as a business to business um, games company. How does that change the way you think about the products that you make and, and the way you interact with the industry as a whole? It, it doesn't, I mean, we, while, while the contracts and the relationships are business to business, the, everything that we think about is, is the consumer, the end consumer. Like um, they are, because uh, we work in free to play, um, mm. there's, there's no margin for error really. You know, we're giving away a product for free that we may have worked on for a year, 18 months. Um, so considerable investment. Um, we've got to make sure that that end player, that end user likes what we've done, that, they have a really smooth introduction to the mechanics that the things that we're presenting to them uh, are of value to them, uh, that they don't feel that it's like a cheap, like take some money and run type mm -hmm. product, like that we're invested in a long-term um, relationship with the, with the player. Uh, and we want to give them things that they enjoy. Um, so essentially, all of our focus is, is there. Um, on the other side of things, our production team uh, and our business development team, they obviously work on keeping the relationship on the business to business side um, smooth and that we're, we're delivering for those clients what they need. But ultimately what they need is their consumer liking the product. So as, as long as everyone thinks that way, we'll, you, we'll probably have a good, get, good game and a yeah. successful launch. It's really interesting to me because you often don't think of things like Rick and Morty and Scotland in the same sentence. 
you know? And I think there's a lot of reasons that people don't write Adult Swim, Dan Harmon, like these things are sort of uniquely um, American, I suppose. But then they're coming to Scott to get the games made. Like, why is that? You know, what makes us... Be- better sounds sort of super competitive, but what makes us better than, you know, going somewhere like LA or Seattle or, you know, a million other cities? Well, I mean... We've worked with uh, Adult Swim for a number of years on a number of different things. Uh, And um, really, it's because we build a great business-to-business relationship Mm -hmm. that these opportunities come our way. Um, uh, The game that we're talking about, um, Pocket Mortis, was actually built by a studio in London called Big Pixel. um, And they were moving on to their new product. And because we were already dealing with Adult Swim on, on something else, and it basically became a conversation. Okay, well, Big Pixel are going to move on to something else. Um, do you guys want to take on this product? And I was like, yeah, well, we love working with you. We have a great relationship. You treat us with respect, um, and we feel that we can. We've got some interesting ideas about what we can do with this product going forward. So yeah, let's let's work together. Um, I'm not sure it's particularly above and beyond any other location. I think it was, it's purely the relationship that we've, we've built with, uh, with our partners over the years. I want to talk to you a bit more about economies of scale. Cause you, you did touch on this before when you said, if you're in London or Edinburgh, you tend to pay through the nose for rents and, you know, Dundee's a bit cheaper. Does that make it easier to succeed because you can essentially be smaller studios putting out, say, fewer products or maybe at a cheaper price point than, you know, if we had this whole hub in Edinburgh, for example? I know I realize we do have studios in Edinburgh, but I just mean the balance between yeah. Dundee and... It, it's... it's um, so larger cities will have more angel investors. They'll have more pots of money available. Um, they'll have... Um, they'll have a more active uh, VC uh, community. Um, so it's touch and go really, because it depends on how you want to run your studio. Like tag has built, uh, itself over the last 15 years through, um, primarily retained profit. Uh, we haven't taken any, uh, large investments. Um, you know, we're a privately owned company. There's a few, there's a few owners, um, Whereas the, I think the opportunity in other locations, London or Edinburgh, is that there's probably more people around that would take a punt at your studio and give you some, give you some cash and maybe be that angel investor to, um, to get you up and running. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, I think it balances itself out really. Um, it obviously having a lower um, cost base is is better, um, mm. you know. But it comes at there are there are issues with being in places that have lower cost bases. You know, do does do, do staff want to stay in those locations? Um, how do you uh, attract um, you know top talent? to come to those locations? How do you attract investment into those uh, locations? Uh, all that kind of stuff. But um, for Tank, it's not really been a problem because our business model has always been about retained profit, grow slowly, grow steadily, um, and not kind of do a big uh, big investment tranche and then grow, you know, go, go from two or three people working in a garage, get some investment and go to, 50 you know in a year you know like that's not that has never been uh, part of tags uh, plan mm. from a growth perspective and i guess this would be interesting from a b2b point of view more so than like a units shipped kind of thing um but when we think about games you know we and tv and all those sorts of things we know we've got like screen scotland and we can sort of portion out how much tv and literature and film rather are worth to the scottish economy like how can we do that with games from your perspective (laughs) well that's a it's a good i mean we've got we've got rockstar building the largest entertainment product in the world 
mm. right in Edinburgh, right? It, I feel like it, that skews the stats slightly, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It eclipses eclipses economies of small countries. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, like they those that team um, does skew the, the numbers a little bit. But I think you, you've got to look at um, the amount of people that are employed uh, directly by the industry or. Uh, indirectly like with the engine teams uh you know you've got we've got unity here uh in in scotland we've got epic we've got yo-yo doing game maker like we've got there's a lot of things here you know mm. um i think once when you look at when you look around i think um i'm, I'm pretty sure there's a there's an amazon base there's an amazon back studio in around as well um like the big players are here in Scotland. They are here. They're just, they're not, um, they're not the flag waving parts of that, those organizations. They're the small, there are smaller parts of those organizations. Um, but I think it's, it's, it, this shows great confidence uh, in Scotland and the talent here that those organizations have, are here and purchasing studios uh, in Scotland. Um, how can you, uh, I don't know whether I answered your question or not really. Um, it's a big, I mean, look, it's a big question, you know, it's a, I'm kind of asking you to solve, you know, a massive industry, um, thing on the back of an envelope. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, I think seeing, uh, unity come into, to Scotland, um, I think they, they, purchased Delta DNA in Edinburgh and they purchased Chili Connect in Dundee. Um, seeing uh, Epic uh, purchase, um, I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. Um, like seeing them come in um, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Amazon have, uh, have got a large stake in a, in a company as well. Um, to me, just screams that the the big players uh, are, are looking here, um, and they understand that the talent is here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and I think that is, uh, I think that's something we can all be pretty proud about. Really, even though it's not uh, tag being uh, acquired by Epic or anything like that, I think we can all be pretty proud that um, our fellow uh, Scots are doing uh, doing very well. The industry, I mean, the industry seems really keen on us, right? That's, you know, I came here sort of knowing that, you know, the games industry in Scotland was big, more from a from an indie side, but seeing how the global industry across the board is so big in Scotland is amazing. Do you think that we need a bigger voice on the world stage or do you think we're just, we're just happy as we are? Which is, you know, nothing wrong with. There's a, there's a cultural thing for, for Scotland. Yeah, it's that yeah, whole thing yeah. Of like, do not put me in the spotlight. I'm just going to yeah. do my shit and do it well. This is it. This, it's, I think it's, you know, over the years, I've worked with a lot of different companies all over the, over the world. And there are, there are definitely people out there that um, will scream and shout about how great they are. Um, and in my opinion, there's not really uh, a reason to be screaming and shouting about how good they are. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, whereas here, like, there are some, you know, that we've got so many great studios, um, and we never hear from them. Uh, no one's, no one's uh, shouting about the Scottish games industry on a on a global scale, um, on on the world's world stage. You know, um, I think it is more of a cultural thing. We prefer to just get on with it, do our job, um, you know, do our job well. Uh, you know, good handshake at the end of, you know, a, a nod and a wink and a thanks very much, you know, like off you go type of thing. Um, yeah, I think, should we be more vocal? Yeah. But who's going to be more vocal? Because I think it's, that's quite, that's quite hard because I think most people just want to get their head down and do their work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess that's where you get into that territory of having thing like an equivalent to Screen Scotland or um, something like that, right? This sort of does, and I I know the work that Brian's doing with the Games Network, and I guess that's part of the motive there is to 
be that voice that kind of you know pushes and, and lifts everyone up while everyone else wants you know needs to focus on the day-to-day of running businesses and building empires i mean it's you know th- those as you know aren't trivial things in and of themselves right so making the extra time to really sing about stuff is is a challenge yeah um it really is and getting the the tone and the voice right is you know um the the industry in scotland has lots of different characters in it and um if there was a if, if there was a equivalent of screen scotland i'm sure if whatever the message they put out there would be some people that say ah uh, that's not uh, i didn't like that message you know whereas mm-hmm. you know it's just it's just the nature of it like there's a lot of different um a lot of different characters, a lot of different opinions about stuff. Um, I think we should be more vocal. I think we should take more pride in um, the the kind of um, clout that we have on the world stage. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the solution is there. To be sure, to be honest, I'm hoping by the time I get to the end of the series, we can sort of cobble together everyone's responses into an hour long episode that's like here's how we're going to solve each of these problems but i think it's useful to you know identify them at least you know yeah absolutely mark thank you so much for coming and chatting it's been a real pleasure no worries well um it's been it's been good fun um speak to you soon Hello again, folks. I hope you enjoyed that conversation between Mark Williamson of Tag Games and our very own Seb Mackay. You can find an article for this episode with some more information and links to follow to find Mark and Tag Games on various places on the internet on the Scottish Games Network website at scottishgames.net. Uh, you can also get in contact with us there if you go to the Contact Us page. Uh, you'll find that email form any uh, feedback you have if you have any suggestions of of who you'd like to hear interviewed on this program if you want to be interviewed yourself please let us know there Um, you can also find us on Twitter as well uh, at Scottish Games you can tweet us there about the podcast as well but uh, that's it that's it for this week so thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time bye bye